Beautiful array of songs. Kind of introduces my message um, of the cross. It began with at the cross, at the cross, but all of those songs give us a picture of what was accomplished for us at the cross. Next week, I'm scheduled to speak on the journey of Israel, which gives us a pattern for the church and also for the individual. And this morning, I would like to take a segment of that journey and um, make a spiritual application that I feel that God is speaking to us for the moment, for the now. There are many heretical winds blowing through the church today. I think we're all aware of that. One of them is telling us that we no longer need the Old Testament. In fact, uh, one of them is telling us that we don't even need the Gospels or the general epistles. And this new doctrine is telling us that all we need is Paul's epistles. Well, I think the Apostle Paul refutes that himself. Categorically, any true student of the word knows that Paul contradicts that idea. For example, in 2 Timothy 3.16, Paul writes that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction, and in righteousness. I've always interpreted all scripture to mean all scripture. How about you? Um, you know, I mean, for me, that settles the question that's good enough. The New Testament was never really put together until the end of the fourth century, so he's actually talking about the Old Testament here. But if you wanted to argue the case, just looking at one of Paul's books, uh, I made a guesstimation, I don't know if that's the correct word, but uh, he makes at least 150 references to the Old Testament, to verses, to people, to, you know, to incidents that took place in the Old Testament. And in fact, he proves his theology from the Old Testament. So you throw out the Old Testament, you're throwing out the pattern we absolutely need the pattern of the Old Testament to prove our New Testament theology. Now, Paul uses eight different words in the New Testament to describe the Old Testament. I hope this goes over with the Spanish uh, contingent here. I don't know how this is going to translate, but he uses the word allegory. The Old Testament was allegory, which means metaphor or symbol. He uses the word example. The Old Testament gives us examples that are relevant for us today. He uses the word ensample, which means a type. He uses the word figure. The Old Testament was a figure of things to come. Figure, pattern, shadow, similitude, which is a resemblance. We find all of the background of the New Testament in the Old Testament. And he uses the word schoolmaster. It was a schoolmaster. So all of those Old Testament symbols were pointing us to Christ. The tabernacle points to Christ. The sacrifices point to Christ. The feasts point to Christ. He was the Passover. He was the unleavened bread. He was the sheaf of the first fruits. All of the Old Testament points to Christ. So to discard the Old Testament pattern uh, is, uh, you know, is damaging any of our theology as far as I'm concerned. I mean, many New Testament truths can only be explained from the Old Testament. For example, if I were to ask you the question, how many days were the disciples in the upper room waiting for the Spirit to be poured out? What would you tell me? 
How many days were they up there? Silence. <laughs> Ten, that's right. But how would we know that? It's not recorded in the New Testament. We find that in the book of Leviticus because the Feast of Pentecost, which means 50, was numbered 50 days from the previous feast, which was the sheaf of the first fruits. Christ arose on the sheaf of the first fruits. He was seen on earth for 40 days. He departed and gave the commission to go to the upper room, so we can deduct that it was 10 days. Much of our end time theology has to come from the Old Testament as well. I mean, you couldn't possibly explain the last week or the last seven years of the church age without going back to Daniel chapter nine. Now last year, I began a little series in my home church that I entitled Trumpet Sounds. And the inspiration for this little series came from a caption that I I saw on the internet, it was actually a sermon, title of a sermon, and it went something like this, the man with the unclear message. Well, that captured my attention. I, I really didn't get into the man's sermon, but the title got me. And so I began a little series on trumpet sounds. And uh, taking my text from 1 Corinthians 14, 8, it provoked me into a seven-part little study here. But in 1 Corinthians 14, 8, it says, For if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to the battle? Now, I'll tell you something. There have been battles that have been lost because of unclear trumpet sounds. And I could tell you a few stories, but I don't think we have time for that. But I have several examples vividly in my mind right now. Today, there are many distorted sounds coming across the pulpit, like the one we just mentioned. And a lot of them are flawed because of their discard of the Old Testament. In Scripture, God's ministers were to be his trumpets. Now, I'm taking my reference from Numbers chapter 10 and verse 8. They were to be his heralds, his trumpeters. And in Numbers 10, 8, it reads, And the sons of Aaron the priest shall blow with the trumpets, and they shall be to you for an ordinance forever throughout your generation. God's ministers were to be his trumpets. They were to proclaim spiritual seasons. For example, the feasts. They were to proclaim the feasts in their seasons, blow the trumpet, and also give the sense of these feasts. In fact, if you want a reference, you could use Psalm 81.3, where they were to blow up the trumpet in the new moon on the appointed day on the feast days. So these trumpeters would sound, these ministers, if an assembly was being called, if God was speaking afresh, if God was moving the camp, if there was an alarm of war. But the point is that God's ministers are his trumpets. Um, we proclaim the seasons when God wants to speak, as we heard last night. Pastor Wallace brought it across very well that we're to be in the know, we're to know his times and his seasons, and it's generally proclaimed by his ministers. Is that right? You see Isaiah, uh, the Lord tells Isaiah to lift up his voice like a trumpet to declare the transgressions of Israel to, to Jacob. Or in Joel, he is to blow the trumpet, sound an alarm in the holy hill. So God's ministers are his trumpeters, his heralds. If that sound is coming across distorted, it puts everybody in confusion, doesn't it? 
and they don't know where they're at. So we want to give clear, distinct sounds from the pulpit where his trumpeters. Now, I've said all of this because I want to herald out a little message here this morning, and I believe that God wants to take us to take hold of it corporately, and I want us to consider the crossing of the Jordan. Now, I realize most of us are aware of the crossing of the Jordan, which is symbolic of death to self or crucified experience. And by the way, this is Rosh Hashanah today. It is the Feast of Trumpets, so hopefully this sound goes forth very clearly and we get the message. Amen. You know, people don't like the message of death to self, but in truth, death to self activates the Christ within. You know, we we hinder the Christ within by our own carnality. And so in the death to self message, we're releasing the Christ within us to perform. We hinder Christ through our own carnality. We limit what he can do. See, when the old Adam dies, then the new Adam can, can manifest himself. Some years ago, I, I was sitting in my front room, and I was sitting in a chair, and I, I dozed off. And I went into a kind of a trance. And in this trance, I'm seeing Christ. And I'm looking through a, a glass. It's like a Coke glass. Did you ever look through a Coke bottle? One of those old green Coke bottles. And I'm looking through this glass, and I tried to move around. I wanted to see Christ so bad. And every time I'd move, I'd see a distorted image of Christ. And I was just so desperately pressing my face to this glass. I wanted to see him so badly. And I just got distorted images. And then the Lord made it clear to me that the distortion is not in Christ. The distortion is right here. And I want to get the distortion out of myself so that I can see Christ. Before Israel could really have dominion over the enemies or possess the land, they had to cross over Jordan, which is symbolic of the crucified experience or the crucified church. And as I said, I know many of you have heard this before, but I really believe God wants us to take hold of it, this message. And because it is Rosh Hashanah, uh, you know, we're, we're kind of at a place in our history where we've got to break through or else we perish. And I believe the key, <clears throat> sorry, I believe the key for us is in the crucified experience. Pastor Bailey came to our church back in the early 80s, and he spoke on the cross, and he said, uh, if we're going to cripple the enemy in this city, here's the key. It's going to be the crucified church. And he said, you know, I was up all last night. I didn't sleep. And then he said, I was reminded of Christ on the eve of his crucifixion. They didn't sleep that night. Well, I don't want to compare myself with Pastor Bailey or Christ, but I was kind of awake all night myself, thinking about this message. Um, You know, we might be aware of it as leaders, but we certainly have to lead our church into the experience. Amen? Amen. We just don't want to be aware of it ourselves, but we want to see our church enter in. Now, last month, I attended a holiness camp meeting. With my wife, she has several nephews who are preachers in the holiness church, so we went to the camp meeting for one night. Her nephews weren't preaching, but it was the familiar message, and and the preacher was preaching on being entirely sanctified. I don't know if any of you have heard the message before, but it's kind of a pet 
doctrine, you know, in the Holiness Church. They're staunch followers of the Arminian view. And the Arminian view is that man plays a major part in his election, which is, which is correct, that we do play a part in our election. But I think the holiness camp puts an overemphasis on human will, human volition. And so the evangelist, very good, except his doctrine was flawed, uh, but he was a very good preacher anyway. Uh, but he was asserting that once we have experienced a second work of grace, that the sin nature is eradicated. I tell you what, that's why many of these people are in bondage, because when they come down to seek the Lord for this experience, the second work of grace, um, and then later on, you know, they testify to it, but then temptation comes and, and they fail. It creates tremendous condemnation. Um, eradication of the sin nature means that you can never be tempted again. If the sin nature is completely gone, then you can never be tempted, which is not correct. And then, interestingly, the next morning, I'm on my way to my office at the church, and I was listening to a radio preacher, and he was preaching just the opposite. And he was saying Jacob Arminius was a heretic, and uh, he was preaching, you know, on the sovereignty of God. We play no part in our election, and so on and so forth. Um, well, long story short, I, I heard two extremes, you know, within a 12-hour period of time, and uh, on the subject of salvation and sin nature. But I want us to look at the Old Testament pattern. We do not generally think of the crucified experience as being a corporate thing. You know, it's more of a personal thing. But here in typology, it seems as though the whole camp experienced that together when they crossed Jordan. It was a group experience. So it was the 40th year. The older generation was dead. Probably the oldest person there was 60. Couldn't have been any older than that, unless it was Joshua or Caleb and his family. And God was beginning to show his power in wonderful ways in that 40th year. And also... They had a rerun of all ten trials again in the 40th year, which tells us that every generation is going to be tested before they go into the promised land. Basically, they had a rerun of all ten trials. Even this smiting of the rock took place in the 40th year. The rock that followed them was Christ, but there was a rerun of all ten trials. God was testing Israel before they would go in. That's what trials are for, aren't they? They're to test us to see what, going, what we're going to do. They're to work humility in our lives. But I think one of the main purposes of the trial is to reveal a nature in us that he wants us to see. He knows it's there, but he wants us to see it so that we can deal with it and be cleansed from it. And we're talking about the old Adamic nature. So in a sense, when they cross Jordan, it's like um, entering in within the veil. And once they pass through Jordan here, they are going to experience a new power and authority against the enemy that they never knew before. Nobody could stand before them at that point. I mean, there's a little bit more to it. They then had to go to Gilgal where they were, they were circumcised. A whole generation had not been circumcised. In fact, there's a whole generation in the church world today that has not been circumcised because the preachers never use the knife today. They never use the sword of the word. It's just a feel-good message and never deal with any issues. <clears throat> 
Joshua said at the end of this campaign, in chapter 23 and verse 9, He said, for the Lord hath driven out from before you great nations and strong, but as for you, no man hath been able to stand before you unto this day. Now, they didn't complete the job, unfortunately, but the enemies that they confronted, um, no man could stand before them. This is after they crossed over the Jordan. Now, I want to consider a little of the before and after effect here of Jordan. And Jesus makes this analogy. If we could look at John 12, 24 for a minute. John 12, 24. He said, uh, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone, but if it die, it bringeth forth much. Now, in short, what this means is unless that seed is planted, dies, germinates, sprouts. Unless it dies, there's no reproduction. It has to go into the ground and die before there's any reproduction. And for the seed that's planted, goes into the ground, it's uh, out of that corruption, it sprouts and it brings forth maybe 30, 60, 100 fold fruit. Um, now, the lesson here concerns the crucified life. You know, Christians undertake many ventures for the kingdom, and they even apply biblical principles, and perhaps they have token results from their endeavors. But, you know, there's a lot of sweat in what they're doing as well. And God wants us to enter into this rest that we're talking about, where there's no sweat. You've heard that expression, no sweat, right? <laughs> you know, in Ezekiel's temple, the priest could not wear wool, wool, any woolen garment or anything that caused sweat. And the truth that comes across there is that God does not want us to be doing the work. He wants to be doing the work. He wants us to cease from our works so that he can work through us. And so, you know, before we really experience the cross, you know, we're, we're doing a lot of sweating. I don't know about you. I have. I've tried all kinds of things. It didn't really pan out. Maybe a little bit, but... See, when God is doing it, there's no sweat. Amen? If you want a reference on that, by the way, it's Ezekiel 44, 18. So, if we want to resurrect the Christ within, we have to die. And when flesh doesn't interfere, then things happen. It's God who's doing the work. It frees God to work. When flesh interferes, the revival dies, doesn't it? When Uzzah touches the ark on the threshing floor, when flesh gets into the revival, the revival died, just like that. As soon as man gets into it. We want to enter into this place where God is doing it. And we're just kind of standing back and watching it happen. You know, you think of Moses who he senses his call to be a deliverer and he, he's going to deliver God's people about 40 years earlier than he was supposed to, I guess. And it was a terrible failure, wasn't it? He kills a man and he has to run, miserable failure. Stephen tells his story in Acts 7. But after about 40 years on the backside of the desert, when the Lord finally appears to him again, manifestly appears to him, uh, and he gives him this commission. Moses has been so humbled, and he realizes how frail humanity really is, and he's saying, well, who am I to do this? And the Lord says, forget the who am I. I am is commissioning you. I am is going to do it. 
All of heaven is going to back you up. It's not, who am I? You know, we get caught up with, well, who am I? Well, that's good, uh, because that's the way I feel, who am I? But God wants us to know that I am. I am is doing it. Amen? I am. So Moses was God's ambassador, and all of heaven was backing him up. When Pastor Bailey died, I was in Greece. I was actually in Corinth, and I, I just arrived that day, and so I never really got to preach in Corinth. I, I went to Athens um, before I mustered out. I had a service in Athens, and then, then I had to you know, change my travel plans, and I came back. Uh, but all the way from Athens to Philadelphia, the Lord was speaking one verse to me from Joshua chapter 1. And it was going over and over in my heart, in my mind. And it reads, well, actually it's chapter 1 and verse 2. Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, thou and all this people, unto the land which I will uh, do give them, even to the children of Israel. Now, I don't want to ignore that message. Uh, I don't claim to be a Joshua. I'm not saying I'm going to lead you in, but it's a message that we need to appropriate. You know, our Moses, he taught us the precepts and he showed us the way. But I think we really need to take hold of, of that message for the now. There were three leaders in Israel that brought God's people into their inheritance. Moses brought God's people out of bondage, taught them the precepts that would enable them to enter into the promised land and, and to, re, to stay in the land as well. But Moses had to stop short, and not only because he was a type, but just not to confuse the types, that's as far as he could bring them because he represented the law. And then Joshua picks up from there, he brings them over the Jordan, brought them into their initial inheritance. But then finally, some years later, it was David who brought them to the ultimate, to Mount Zion. Now, Moses, our Moses was, was Dr. Bailey, Pastor Bailey, and he showed us the way, didn't he? Basically, we're all here today because God uh, imparted the knowledge to him to show us the way in. And I want to see us all experience this message. Uh, I know there's a number of here that can testify to the Romans 6.6 6 experience. You know, when God is moving, people enter into things very quickly. My, my brother Paul said uh, that when he was at Elam back in the 60s and revival was going on, he experienced the Romans 6.6. 6. He was just a teenager. Now, when God is moving, things happen very quickly, and we enter into things very quickly. Uh, I think I think that sometimes we complicate this, this message too much. We make it something that it isn't. And, uh, you know, we're not all like Pastor Bailey. We're not going to all have the same experience that Pastor Bailey had. We're not all going to be carried up in a vision and hang on a cross with Christ. But God can bear witness in many ways that it's broken, that sin nature is broken. And we have the victory, and we know it by the evidence of that. Knowing this, we know it by the facts. The things that one time held us no longer hold us in bondage. And in fact, they become despicable to us, and, and we despise them. But we want to experience this Romans 6, 6, and we want to lead our, our congregations into it as well. Now, I have a little, I don't have the professional 
graphics on the wall, but there is one out there. It's kind of a non-professional um, drawing here. You have that there. Well, forgive my, my artwork there. Uh, not to scale by any means, but let me just summarize this, this crossing a little bit and then we'll look at some of the verses. But Israel has finally come to the brink of, does this thing work? Hmm. Isn't that amazing? This thing worked right up until now. What happened to it? Well, there's a faint little dot up there. I don't know if you can see that. Israel has come to the, to the brink of the Jordan. The Jordan, it's time of harvest. Rivers overflowing its bank, and, and this is their crossing point here. And the priests are going to have to step in first now. We have to make a point on that because the ministers have to experience the message first, don't they? Before they can lead the congregation over, we have to experience it ourselves. Boy, I can't believe this thing. Um, anyway, uh, they had 12 men elected from every tribe that were to take 12 stones. You know, maybe the next time I'll be better prepared. I used to be a Boy Scout one time. We're supposed to be prepared. Uh, that's our motto. It was, anyway. Um, they took 12 stones from out of the midst of Jordan and put it on the resurrection side, the promised land side, symbolizing the 12 tribes. You know, the old life is, is going here. There is something that's happening here. The, the wilderness is going to be behind them, and God has been dealing with them. They've been dealt with on a number of issues. But they take 12 stones, symbolizing the 12 tribes. They put them on the, the promised land side of the Jordan. See, this, this river is going to back up. When the priest stepped into this river, this river backs up all the way to a town called Adam. See, God is going to deal with the old Adam. He's going to take it all the way back to the old Adam. The old Adam nature is going to be dealt with. So 12 stones come out of the Jordan, put on the resurrection side. 12 stones are put in the midst of Jordan. They're going to be covered. Uh, the old life is going to be dealt with. There's a severing from the old Adam here. So you get the picture here. The old life, the old Adam is going to be dealt with. And there's going to be a new Adam on the other side. It's going to be a new beginning here. They're on the promised shore, the resurrection side. Okay, if you want to look with me at uh, Joshua chapter 3. I better brief this up. I, uh, maybe I shouldn't read this, this whole account. I was going to read it through, but we're getting short on time. So anyway, from Joshua chapter 3 all the way through <coughs> 16. And as I just said, um, when they passed over this when they stepped into the, the Jordan, the river backed up all the way to Adam. And it was the priests who had to experience this first. That's the point I want to get across. It's the ministers who have to experience this message so that we can lead our congregation across as well into this experience. And it was also the time of harvest. Um, 
But the old Adam here is going to be dealt with. You know, in verse 16, it, it better reads, uh, the water is dammed up all the way back to the city of Adam. See, God is dealing with a nature that's going all the way back to the fall of Adam, the Ad Adamic nature. We're not talking about salvation here. We're, we're talking about the sin nature. Amen? Now, in the New Testament, this place is called Bethabara. You find it in John's Gospel, chapter 1 and verse 28, I think. This is where John was baptizing, John the Baptist. And Bethabara means house of passage. You know, the way I read that is that this is the only place that Israel could have entered into the promised land. They had to go that route. And what I'm talking about is they had to go through the cross route to get into the promised land. They had to go that way. Through Bethabara. And so the old life is going to be dealt with. It's rendered inactive. They're now on the resurrection side. They're empowered to walk in their new life. They've experienced a day of atonement, and things are going to dramatically change here. There's long-standing obstacles are going to be cut away, and there's a circumcision that's going to take place, and that's very important too, but I'm not going to have time to get into that. They had to be circumcised before they could inherit the promised land. That was one of the requirements given to Abraham concerning the promised land, that only the circumcision could inherit these promises. Now, remember, going back in Israel's history in the early part of their journey, the confession of Israel concerning the promised land. They sent spies in. They returned. They said, the enemy is too strong for us. There's giants. There's walled cities. We can't possibly take them. And all of the heart of Israel was fainting, and they were crying and weeping and said, you know, we can't do it. Well, there were seven particular enemies in there. They all speak of works of the flesh. But now, Israel crosses over the Jordan, and things reverse. The enemy is fainting. The enemy is saying, how are we going to deal with these people? And, you know, the point is that the New Testament promises uh, dominion over sin. Dominion over sin. It's not eradication of sin, but the dominion over sin. That the things that one time were too strong for us, we have dominion over them now. And it's not eradicated, but those things don't trouble us anymore because we have the dominion. Amen? When they crossed over, something took place. So now the enemy is fainting. They're saying, who can stand before them? And I tell you this, if God is for us, who can stand against us? Amen? If God is for us, there's nothing that can stand against us. And so in Joshua chapter 5 and verse 1, you see where their heart is melting. This is the enemy. And there's no more spirit in them anymore because of the children of Israel. How things reversed. You know, Christ spoiled principality and power. And I think in one translation, it reads that he reversed things here. I forgot exactly how that went. But, you know, you can see how things reversed. <laughs> On this side, the enemy is too strong for us. On that side, the enemy is saying, who can deal with Israel? That's why on this Rosh Hashanah, we want to hear what God is saying, and we want to cross over, and we want to come into this inheritance. We want to uh, let our hearts be circumcised from these seven enemies within before we can deal with the seven enemies without. Amen? And we have the power to do that now because now we can yield our members to do the right thing and, and we're going to find a new authority to rid ourselves of these, the old Adam nature. So now Christ reveals himself as the captain of the hosts. <laughs> 
that they crossed over. Now the Lord says, I'm fighting for you now. No sweat when God is fighting. Amen? So if God be for us, who can stand? You see, the death to self message releases God to fight for us. This is the message that Satan fears the most. He's not afraid of prosperity messages. He's not afraid of the bless me messages or any of that. But he's afraid of this message right here because it's the crucified church that's going to do him in. And he knows it. Now, in my church, I guess I, uh, I draw illustrations from Pilgrim's Progress all the time. You know, they, they kind of, it's kind of a joke. It's, but, you know, Spurgeon did the same thing. He drew illustrations from Pilgrim's Progress all the time as well. But, you know, I want you to consider the Pilgrim. He has come through the gate of salvation. He's saved, and he's carrying this huge burden, and he's struggling with it. He's not much good in the kingdom, is he? Because he's, he's weighed down with this burden. He's trying to get rid of it. How can I get rid of this thing? He's asking different ones, how can I get rid of this burden? Well, you know what this burden is, don't you? It's a sin nature, and he's struggling with it. Can't get rid of it. He's in the kingdom, all right. But then one day, he's ascending this hill, and at the top of the hill, there's a wayside cross, and as the shadow falls across him, he now sees himself on this cross, and the burden snaps, breaks, rolls down the hill into an open grave. You know, we're talking about getting rid of the nature that dominates us. He's free. He's dancing. He's jumping for joy. He just got rid of something that was a total plague in his life. See, at salvation, we see Christ on the cross. But in the crucified experience, we see ourselves with Christ on the cross. Now, theoretically, we were there when we got saved. We were with Christ on the cross. But we don't know that yet. It takes us some time before we see it. And when we see it, then something happens. That's the new covenant. Dominion over sin. Not eradication, but dominion. See, the false grace message excuses sin. The true grace message enables us to have victory over sin. Now, everybody's experience is different. I, I, I try to think of my own experience. It was To me, I can describe it like, well, did you ever have a fever in the middle of the night? You're burning up with a fever. I'm sure we all have. But it was like a fever that broke in the middle of the night and all of a sudden, I could go to sleep. I could breathe easy. It was gone. And things that troubled me before, they had no power over me anymore. In fact, they were detestable to me. Something had happened. See, knowing this is knowing from experience that, that something has changed. The things that were temptation have lost their power over me. It's not as though they're not there. You, know, you can always resurrect them if, if you choose to let them resurrect. But we want to have the dominion over that nature. I kept saying to myself, well, maybe I'm sick. Maybe, I, maybe this will change. Maybe I kept thinking, maybe I'm just dreaming that this happened. But it happened. Paul said, sin shall not have dominion over you. Amen. Just have a couple minutes here. But do you see, the enemy is not afraid of the easy grace, prosperity message. He fears the church that's going to take this course, going the Bethabra, crossing over into the promise of God. And 
These who do that will not only inherit the promised land, but the harvest that's waiting as well. I remember back in 82 when the good Dr. Bailey was preaching on the cross in our church, and he said a number of things I'd like to relate, but there, there's not time for that. But he said this. He said, in the baptism in the Holy Spirit, you have power over demons. It's outer court. But he said, in the crucified experience, you have power over angels. And to see principalities stripped, we need to identify ourselves with the cross. Amen? You know, Jonah experienced that death and resurrection. He went the hard route, but <laughs> nevertheless, he experienced a death and a resurrection. And when you see the result of that, just what one man could do to the most powerful and evil city on the face of the earth, that one man in the resurrection power brought this city down to their knees. Now, I'd like to believe that the crucified church, the crucified fellowship can do the same thing. That when we go this route, that the enemy trembles before us and we can bring down cities and strongholds. One man, one church, one fellowship. Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise and go over this Jordan. I think that perhaps God has been dealing with many of us on things, exposing things in our lives. And God wants us to, to experience a death blow to that old nature and have victory. But my, my main point is this. We as leaders have to experience that so that we can bring our congregations into it. And I do believe that it's going to happen very quickly, and I believe that many people can experience that together. And so we'll let uh, Pastor Sigsby close with this song. Maybe we can just pray after that. Amen?